Hello, I'm Bonnie Langford, and this is The Sirens of Audio. It's all very well to make these demands, but Doctor Who fans already have a plethora of podcasts to choose from. I created the show you host on your platforms. I have a right to the subscription. I'm well aware of that, great podcaster. I would willingly get this fan to write a thousand reviews if Apple Podcasts allowed it. And I would write them willingly. You see how devoted we are. But you'd get very little for him writing a review or subscribing. And I would be without a good anorak. Good anoraks are very hard to find. I do not wish to hear any more from your prattling tongue. Oh, forgive me. I what? I need more subscribers. I cannot reach more audience without them. We'll do our best for you. I'm sure Anorak can engage in a little creative bot activity on your behalf. I already do, madam. I'm a past master at the double entry. Then you must make it triple. You heard what Audiophile said. He needs the subscribers. Do not call me by my name on an open channel! I'm so sorry, great podcaster. Such is my enthusiasm for your cause. My tongue sometimes speaks what my mind would not dare to think. Please accept my apologies. I would sooner accept your subscription. Ha 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 ha. Ha 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 ha. G'day audiophiles, this is the Sirens of Audio, the show that explores the universe of Doctor Who and the audio medium. I'm Dwayne. And I'm Philip. G'day Dwayne, g'day audiophiles. G'day Philip, how's things? Yeah, things are good, thank you. How are things for you? Fantastic. Now, for, for eagle-eyed viewers of our YouTube channel, you would have seen on the thumbnails that we're sort of heading into a 60th anniversary theme for Doctor Who, because we've got the anniversary coming up very, very soon. How are you feeling about it? Well, I think the TV we, version, that is. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I'm very excited. I love, uh, yeah, I'm just excited. I, I love David Tennant. I love, love Russell T. Davis. I love yeah, Donna. And so I'm excited to see what's going on. Very good. It's coming close so, to now. It's, it's going to be, be honest in no time. Where's, my, where's this year gone? It is utterly ridiculous that this year's gone so fast. Yeah, it sort of all seems to be happening very fast too right now. So, mm. yeah, so... Uh, for those who uh, are tuning in for the first time, we're about to uh, start a series of podcasts up until the anniversary special in November and maybe a little bit beyond, where every episode of the podcast is going to be dealing with some kind of anniversary style theme. And this theme uh, for this episode, it, we are going to focus on the 1993 story, The Paradise of Death. Now, it's not an anniversary story in itself, but it was released in the 30th anniversary year. It was packaged with the 30th anniversary logo. And in, as we speak right now, uh, it has been almost exactly 30 years since it was broadcast. So it's a very interesting little release, The Paradise of Death. And uh, we're going to talk about that uh, in depth in a moment. But before we do that, Philip, do you know what? No, what, train? We need to jump down the rabbit hole. Here we go. <laughs> right, Philip, we're in the rabbit hole. And I just want to ask, this is going to be nothing special. Um, well, it could be special, but uh, nothing too controversial, I hope. Um, I just want to get your thoughts on the first time you were consciously aware of an anniversary celebration uh, on of, of Doctor Who, because I know you're a huge fan of the Three Doctors, but you probably weren't consciously aware of the Three Doctors at the time. So what was your first Doctor Who anniversary experience uh, in real time? In real time would have been the 20th anniversary 
Mm-hmm. So that would be 1983. I would have been in year nine. No, uh, no, year, ooh. yeah, year nine. I would have been in, and yeah. So that that was my first knowledge. And there's a big build up to it. It's one of the few shows. I mean. Australia's, Australia's viewing of Doctor Who has been bizarre in terms of, you know, when I start, first started watching the show as a you know, 10, 11 year old, it was constantly repeating over and over again. And then they'd add a new season in and then they'd go back and just, so Doctor Who was always on. But when we hit Peter Davis and that, and even to Tom's last season, it was a bit disjointed in terms of how long it would take. I mean, I, I think they had to walk the episodes from the UK to Australia. Um, because it seems to take forever for them to actually arrive. Um, so it always took a very long time and they were disjointed and all over the place and sometimes mixed in the wrong order as new series came. But because it was, it was a special anniversary special, it appeared straight away. And so we got to see it. Um, it, it was, it was shown, it was a special viewing. Uh, on the ABC, I'm trying to think, I think they've even been on the anniversary or the night before the anniversary. Actually, I think it was on the night of the anniversary, which makes me think, I, th- I think we saw it before the UK did, because we're so many hours ahead. And we, we actually got to watch it first. So I think, you know, anywhere in the world, we we got to watch that episode first. And yeah, that Five Doctors episode blew me away. I did actually already know the story because I'd read the book before, because the book was released, I think by mistake before the show came out and I'd actually been at a Doctor Who function and bought the book and read the whole book in a, an hour or two because it's a pretty easy read. It's sort of Terrence Sticks's slackish version of the time when he was writing. You know, he yeah. wrote really wrote really good at the beginning, he wrote really good at the end, but there's a whole middle section where he just went blah from the script. So there's nothing particularly interesting in it. There's actually there is a scene with Susan being taken in the book. Right, which doesn't appear in the TV series. Where it's, so it's it's Susan in the future of Earth, and I think she's on a travelator, um, and it and her being taken and thinking about her grandfather and the the, the thing appearing. So I think that's the that might be the only scene I think that's in the book that's not in the TV series. But I remember being very excited by that because it was a great little scene. So yeah, so for me it would be the twentieth, and for you, Dwayne, what's the first your first anniversary memory? My first anniversary would be the 25th anniversary, which was a little bit different because it was incorporated within the season. There was no special episode apart from, well, they they, they say Silver Nemesis was the, the special episode, but because, like you said, we were delayed in getting the episodes, um, we got Remembrance of the Daleks uh, after Dragonfire, and we saw that. And I just remember how blown away I was by the first episode because... That season 24 had me a little bit worried. Um, I I was very serious and earnest in my in my sort of middle teenage years there, and uh, I was worried that it was getting a bit too silly. And then Remembrance of the Daleks came on. I thought, wow, this is this is Mm. it. And uh, what a what a fantastic story because I consider Remembrance and Silver Nemesis to be the anniversary stories. Both of them. They both have callbacks to those earlier. stories within within the classic era uh, which i think is vital for for anniversary stories so um and there was a lot of hype around it too i just i'd not long joined the doctor who club so there was a lot of hype coming through the through data extract people talking about it particularly particularly silver nemesis some of the things like the the chessboard there was a big thing about the chessboard in there where that was leading and the, the mystery that was getting injected back into Doctor Who. So that whole season seemed to be like a build-up of anticipation for what was to come. And it was very exciting for me as a young fan, not knowing any of the politics behind with, behind the fact that the BBC hated it, uh, behind, behind the fact that J&T was always trying to get out of producing it. I knew none of that. So not knowing any of that and just seeing what was on the screen was, was, pretty, was pretty special. I was highly anticipating series 26 and i think those anniversary stories had a lot to do with with uh bu- that build up to season 26 and it, i think it might have given the production team at the time the confidence to go ahead with what they did um it's just such a shame it didn't continue on from there but those last two years of the classic series were were something pretty special i think uh not least because of those anniversary stories. Hmm. Speaking of anniversary stories, we're about to look at a story from the 30th, 
and there was a television 30th anniversary story, The Dimensions of Time. Did you um, do you remember seeing that? I mean, it wasn't actually no. officially shown on Australian TV. No. No, no, I never saw it. I heard all about it. And I also heard about this thing called the Dark Dimension. And there were rumours of Tom Baker coming back. And I thought, this is going to be interesting. But that's kind of left as well, sort of as quickly as I heard about it, went on to something else. Um, but there was also the talk about uh, Spielberg uh, getting the rights to Doctor Who and making something as well. So I was pretty excited about that, uh, about the possibility of that, because you know, Star Trek Next Generation and I think by that stage Deep Space Nine were both going full swing as well. So I thought, oh, wow, if the Americans get hold of Doctor Who, it could be something really special. Because those, those two shows I really followed heavily in the in the late 80s, early 90s. So um, I, was, I was excited about that. But no, never saw Dimensions in Time for a, until a lot later. Right. Did you I, see uh, it? I did. My cousin... In England, he posted it, he, so he videoed it and sent me a video. So a VHS arrived with the glasses, the 3D glasses, because okay. so, it's done in 3D. So a couple of months after it was on, I, I got to watch. And then he recorded lots of other things that had been on at the same time, too. So I had a whole, I still have it, I still have it, a VHS of, the, you know, and I would have watched it lots and lots of times with the glasses on. And there's there's actually a whole I said, kids' programs I think, explaining how the technology works and the movement and why it has to go from left to right and... So the, all that is explained about how to make it 3D. You, you have seen it now, though, haven't you? Oh, yes. Yeah. I don't really consider it an anniversary story as such. It's just a, I don't know. It's a bit like um, the Rowan Atkinson thing. It's like comic relief type. Well, it was comic relief, wasn't it? Uh, or was it before comic relief? I, that's a good question. I don't know if it was comic relief or not. I, I think because it was it was a, a mashup between East Enders and Doctor Who, wasn't it? It was because it's all done the sets of East Enders and, and with lots of the East Enders cast in it too. Yeah, at that stage. So I don't I don't really consider it a a real story myself. I don't know about you. <laughs> no, I don't think it is. But it was certainly an anniversary special. Um, yeah, just you know, it's a bit like the Star Wars Christmas special. It's absolute garbage, but it's still nevertheless there as a special. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, we can totally discount it, that's okay, but it's, yeah, it's there, it's a piece of history. Yeah, interesting. I, I, I can look at it now and, and see it for what it is, but at first I was kind of, well, well yeah, I can see what everyone's talking about. Mm. It, it got but, but that does start John Pertry and Elizabeth Slayton together, and it's Nicholas Court, is it too? <laughs> yeah, very good. All right. Shall we climb up out of the rabbit hole? Let's. And uh, have a talk about... The Paradise of Death. Now, when I suggested this to you, Philip, how did you feel about going back and revisiting this? I had really bad memories of this. And I was sort of thinking, oh, I'm not sure I really want to go and listen to this again. It's been a long, long time. But I just do what I'm told. So I went back. I listened. <laughs> I um, I don't have this on. This is the... I've never. It's been re-released a few times on CD in a few various packages, but I've I've only got it on cassette, and uh, I was able to to rip it uh, digitally so I could get listen to it on my headphones, and um, yeah, so it's the it's the only the only copy I have, which was fine. Um, now let me read what's on the back of this. Um, it's not your usual blurb that I'll that I'll read. Um, it says, BBC Radio Collection welcomes the Doctor back to Earth for the only new recording in this, his 30th anniversary year. Included is additional material which had to be cut from the radio broadcast for time reasons. Well, that's interesting. John Pertwee returns as the renegade Time Lord, reunited with Sarah Jane and the Brigadier by author Barry Letts, the producer behind so many of his adventures. And he is facing more danger than ever. When an horrific and inexplicable death occurs at Space World, a new theme park on Hampstead Heath, Brigadier Lethbridge-Stewart and Unit are called to investigate. The Doctor is highly suspicious. Just who controls the Paracon Corporation, the shadowy organisation behind the running of the park? What is experience reality? And what are the limits of its awesome powers? Where do you keep your teapot, Doctor? I could murder a cup of tea. Go, go, go! Not bad at all. Oh, yes. You'd swallow a clack look and choke on a menian dust fly. A clack, clack look? A clack look, yes. A large, lumpy beast, a bit like a moose with no horns. 
The nervous creature had had two heads, so that a pack of patty-pangs couldn't creep up on it. I never knew whether it was coming or going. Since whenever I painted my toenails pink. It's quite clear to me... Moron! If you don't know the width of your car, you shouldn't be driving it! For Pete's sake, Doctor, slow down! Well, well, it's the journalist girl. I warn you, the Brigadier knows that I'm here. Oh, is that so? And where's the Brigadier? Exactly. Very satisfactory. And what are you going to do about it, Sarah Jane Smith? Grim bunch, weren't they? <laughs> Old Iron Gron and his chums. Who are you, Doctor? Somebody who spent a long weekend on Aldebaran II a few years ago. Too long a weekend. The food was disgusting. <laughs> yes, it is, isn't it? How many recipes are there for cactus pulp? Clown, you are dead. Yeah, well, wait. Uh, you'll not attack before I'm ready. Oh, no. We kill each other, but we do not cheat. Thank you. Any sign that this unfortunate affair was anything more than a peculiarly horrible murder, then of course I would... But that's just it. That's exactly why unit is involved. Well, now I'm reversing the pseudo-polarity of the metaphorical synapses in only as putative energy channels. And that's just as nonsensical and just as effective. <laughs> I don't like the idea of his running around loose. He could be a problem. Agreed. I'll find him. Maybe the problem needs a solution. Terminal one. You mean the thick Kimonia tribe of bats? No, 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 Brigadier. They're riding them. Look. Why did President Nixon keep the Watergate tapes? Or why did the Nazis keep neat registers of the horrors they perpetrated? They think they're all powerful. All right, chef. Let him have it. Well done, everybody. All right, Jeremy, you can come out now. It's a blasted monster and it's right behind them. You young puppy! I'll have your whip for that! Okay, so what what are some of the highlights from this story for you, Philip? I think they're going to be similar to mine. Oh, you want highlights first, do you? Okay. <laughs> no, yeah, no, let's we, start with the highlights. Let's start with some highlights. Um, the first highlight for me is Elizabeth Sladen's performance. So Elizabeth is acting her socks off throughout this entire five episodes. There's not a, a note she hits wrong. She shows emotion and humor and pathos and everything that's required. She doesn't ha necessarily have fantastic lines, but any line she has, she makes the best of. And that to me just, just stands out in terms of Elizabeth, I think Sarah Jane Smith as a character, you know, journalist, feminist, you know, there's, there's, it's, it's, it's a lot of dot points, but the character comes to life because of the performance Elizabeth brought to it, and she's managed to recapture all that in this story. So for me, just hearing her voice in particular, I just loved. Um, you know, John Pert is actually sounding a bit old. Nicholas Courtney hasn't got a lot to do in this, um, which is really a shame because, you know, he's, you know, a great actor. But they don't—they don't, they don't give him a lot to do. And in terms of the other highlight of me, I think the first two episodes in particular, I really enjoyed. My memory was I didn't really enjoy the show, but when I actually went back, the first two episodes, I was really surprised by how good they were. The sound design, the story—that was really, really good. Um, then they leave Earth, and my opinion changes slightly. But first two episodes, really great. What are some of the highlights for you, Dwayne? Yeah, hearing that trio of the Brigadier. Sarah and the Doctor together is fantastic. It's just wonderful to hear them all. Um, I hear what you're saying about John Pertwee sounding older. I was thinking exactly the same thing, and it made me think, hmm, if if for some reason John Pertwee ever was able to do Big Finish, this might have been the sound of the Doctor we had, because you know some of our Doctors are getting older and their voices have changed a little. So having been through that with other doctors, it's it's not hard to cope with. But I think he loves playing the doctor too, and that comes through in his performance. He just loves doing it. He has a lot of fun. Nicholas Courtney is just is just reliable as ever. Um, the other standout for me was uh, Peter Miles uh, as Tragen. Uh, he's a quintessential third doctor villain because we've got him in the beginning and the end of the Pertwee era. In Invasion of the Dinosaurs and and uh, in the Silurians. Silurians yeah. He's also uh, famous for being NIDA in Genesis of the Daleks. So he's a very, very recognisable voice. And he's also got one of those voices that never aged. 
So this is 20 years after he'd done, you know, those 70s stories. And his voice was exactly the same. And even when he was in Big Finish, was at Big Finish maybe eight years later, he still sounded the same. It was an incredible voice. And uh, just just so good. Some of the other voices, though. Harold Innocent uh, is the name of the actor who plays Freeth, who is the who is kind of, he's the, he's the bad guy, he's kind of the second in charge of the planet, Paracon, where we're going to end up. I didn't realise who Harold Innocent was until I did a bit of research, and he actually plays Gilbert M. in The Happiness mm. Patrol. Did you know that? I did know that. Uh, and and so I could see his face then. Yeah. Uh, and it sort of just didn't, it didn't, it seemed to be miscast. Uh, for that, it sort of, sort of took a. It was a bit over the, bit too over the top. Um, because we've got Morris Denham in there too, playing his dad, which and Morris Denham is great, because of course we had him in the Twin Dilemma, and uh, very very famous actor. Um, who I think he would have been good, but they he sounded the same age as Harold Innocent, uh, as far as I was concerned. Um, we also had Dominic Letts, which was Barry's son playing a couple of little roles in there. And Jane Slaven, so someone very familiar to us uh, for from Big Finish. Uh, this is her first time appearing in audio for Doctor Who all those years before Big Finish. So she had a quite a major role uh, in this. Uh, it, and it, I, I think it, actually we got Jane talking about that on, on her interview. So I might put a bit of that here. Now, I believe your first Doctor Who recording, though, was with The Paradise of Death. Is that right? It Long was, ago. yeah. Um, it, that was in the 90s. And I didn't really know, I didn't know about the world of Doctor Who. I mean, I knew I'd watched Doctor Who. Tom Baker was my doctor. Um, and so I knew of it, but I didn't realise what a big thing it was. I couldn't, because there was one day when we had photographs and we never had photographs for radio. Uh, but John Pertwee and Liz Sladen got their costumes on and they were their original costumes. And I thought, how weird is that? But of course, now I know it's not weird. That's what they do. So um, what was it like working with John Pertwee? Oh, it was fabulous. I mean, he was very, he was very grand. He was, he was, oh, darling. If you go to this restaurant in Chiswick, just mention my name and they'll let you in. You know, it's that kind of thing. Um, I don't know if anybody ever does that, you know, when someone says, yeah, just mention my name. Can you imagine going in and saying, I just uh, work with John Pertwee. Could I have a meal <laughs> here, please? Um, but no, he was fabulous. And because the, the brigadier was there as well. Nicholas um, Courtney. He, yeah, Nick Courtney was in it. And so it, I was aware that they were legendary. You know, and they'd, they'd got a whiff of legend about them. And I'd worked with, I knew Liz really through Brian Miller because I'd worked yep. a lot with Brian Miller. So she was in really his husband and her, her, his wife. And also she'd been Tom's assistant companion for quite a while, hadn't she? So the two, two and a half years she was Tom's companion oh, and one year with John. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. So, yeah. So it was quite, it was quite magical and a bit, and a bit, odd i didn't realize I, I didn't realize the ramifications i didn't realize that i would still i still get mail from fans about paradise of death what was the recording like was it the old traditional all of you stand around the microphone and yeah it was like um regular radio because it's different big finish do it differently but the big finish are kind of the only ones who do it so differently uh so this one was um yeah conventional it was in um, the BBC. I think I think we recorded at Made of L Studios. Um, uh, yeah, that's yeah. It was it, it was like an ordinary radio, and then I realised much later it wasn't because I put my script in the bin to be recycled, and about four people went, "No, what are you doing? What are you doing?" <laughs> I pulled my script out of the bin. It's like, oh, okay, that's the way it goes. So and do you I still thought, have it? No. No, I gave it to one of them. I thought, well, do you take it then, love, if you want it. And sure enough, about a year ago, uh, one of the scripts turned up on eBay. As they, they do. Trying to, 
they were trying to hawk it for a hundred quid or something. I don't know. So it's a cast. There's actually 21 listed cast members. Because one of the things that actually struck me as we're going through is there are so many characters, often with only it's a too few, many, isn't it? Often with only a few lines. So you know, I'm just not used to. Without we finish, I'm just not used to having 21 people in a mm. in a five part play. It's just astounding. And it's a, and a lot of the parts was un, to me it felt unnecessary. That there was a couple of lines given to you know someone was employed to do a couple of lines, which didn't add anything, which could have been done by another character just saying something offside. Just the number of people that just didn't seem to be needed, um, and all these bits bits characters. But I think it actually shows it's the BBC producing this, not um, Big Finish, because you know I said Big Finish would never do that, and the BBC traditionally always employs huge numbers of actors for voice work. So I guess it wasn't an unusual thing. But it just meant you had a lot of people and names coming up all the time. So another thing that threw me totally was actually the music, um, because it was just the wrong era. Yes, so, so <laughs> I it, thought that too. It was interesting. You know, when, when Big Finish started, Gary Russell only used the Tom Baker theme, because to him that was the quintessential. Quintessential is that the word? Quintessential. Um, quintessential. That's the word. That's a much better word than the one I'm trying to make up. Uh, the quintessential um, theme was the, the John Purdy, Tom Baker theme. And so for a long time, Gary Russell only used that. And then finally, but he bowed to pressure and actually gave each doctor their theme. Because when you hear a doctor's theme, you immediately go to the credits and you go to the doctor. And so you can't, you can't muck, muck up, muck up. You know, even, even Peter Davis and Colin Baker's themes, which are fairly similar, they're still different enough for you to go, oh, hang on, I know which doctor it is. And so when this started, and it's the sixth Doctor theme being played for the third Doctor, it just didn't feel right. And every time the theme came up between episodes, I went, ah. Oh. So it actually broke me out of reality bits because of the theme. I noticed it, but I, and I did put those connections together with it being the wrong era. But it reminded me how much I love Peter Howell and his version of the theme is actually my theme, really. I think for me, that's that's the. I know it. I know it's. I know the seventies theme is the quintessential one, but for me personally, it's the Howl theme that always gives me all the feels. And uh, I guess it was used because he was the one doing the incidental music, so he used it too. I don't know if you noticed, but the key of the theme was tweaked up just slightly. So it's a different key to the actual television theme. So did you notice that? Well, no, I hadn't tried to sing it. So no, I, I hadn't picked it up. <laughs> you know, just here. Well, um, I, I kept trying to think, is this because it's a key higher or is it because the tape play that I've got is going a little bit too fast? Because that's <laughs> that's a possibility as well. But it, did, it, definitely se- it definitely seemed a bit higher. So I think the key has been raised. So the theme goes a little bit quicker because it's for, for, for radio. Um, but yeah, because Peter Howell did it, I thought I thought his music was quite good. I've, I've got a music suite somewhere of that whole thing, and I thought it was on the cassettes there, but I, it's not on the cassettes, so I don't know where I've got this thing and where I've heard it before, but I have heard the music suite separately. And uh, I thought it was quite good, quite cinematic uh, mm. in, in style. So, um, but yeah. Not not Dudley Simpson at all. No, not which like doesn't that. it doesn't doesn't quite fit. I should, I, Did you, did, I didn't mind the music. There's a couple, actually there's some Dudley Simpson moments in it because there's there's the um there's that lovely theme in Ambassador of Death where where you see this Shaw sort of like it's a running sort of flute piece and there's a couple of times that that sort of a similar theme that appeared and I thought yeah. oh that sounds like Dudley Simpson so there, there were moments there was Dudley Simpson in ish. Um, can I say you, married, you mentioned Harold, Harold Innocent earlier too. He actually died between episode three and four of this being released the first time. So oh, wow. he filmed this and a couple of months later he died. And it was actually while this was being put out each each week, that he, okay. um, he died between episode three and four. There's another useless piece of trivia for you. Oh, fascinating. Did you know that this was um, adding to existing Doctor Who canon? So this is set precisely after the Time Warrior and before Invasion of the Dinosaurs. So this is the actual first official meeting of Sarah Jane Smith and the Brigadier. 
Yes, but it doesn't quite work, though, does it? Oh, I think it's okay. It doesn't. It doesn't really fit into that. I, I don't know why they chose that. I mean, there's lots of other gaps they could have used. I, I don't know why they tried to use that gap because it really doesn't quite work. What's another gap they could have used? I suppose they could have gone anywhere between Death to the Daleks and Monster Peladon. Yeah, anywhere between there. Yeah. Yeah, so there's lots of other options. Um, can I give you some of my other negatives? You got a few? Well, let, let, let me just start off with two. Um, okay. I, I do think once it leaves Earth, it loses the plot. You've got too many villains. It's just, and, and you just don't care. To be perfectly honest, I just did not care. Once they left Earth to this pl- other planet, uh, I don't know, yeah, who cares? You know, let them all go. Uh, um, so my, my care level ceased at that point. Which is a bit of a shame, and but my main negative of this story is Jeremy, new character <laughs> created. Um, Jeremy which, Fitz Oliver. Yeah, Jeremy Fitz Oliver. It's the most hideous, hideous. Actually, there's, there's another character that's worse, which is in Big Finish. There's a male companion that they add in during the Klein stories, who is equally hideous. Um, but yeah, Jeremy Fitz Oliver, just such a twat of a character serves no purpose, um, is just pathetically drawn. Um, nothing against the actor. Richard Pierce is a renowned voice actor. He's done hundreds and hundreds of productions. I think he's still working today. It, it has nothing to do with his performance. It just has to do with the fact that the character was an absolute wally. Who I, just I think need. the performance was good because you can tell that he's performing what was written. And he's doing a good job at what was written, yeah, but, but what, what was, was written, written was not awful. good. Awful, <laughs> like, and then, and from my memory, the next one goes to be in space is even worse. Well, yeah, the whole story is pretty painful. Yeah, but, but I think I, my understanding is, my memory is him as a as an actor. I think I've only listened to it goes to be in space once, but yeah, my my memory of the character is that he's even more annoying and problematic and just painful, and I just have no idea why it's there. Uh, is, it, is it supposed to be a comedy relation characters for the kids? I just, he, he makes no sense in the story. He makes no sense as a character. I, I don't know. I mean, Barry he, he does a, get a mention in uh, the Big Finish version, doesn't he? In the first maybe, episode, she mentions him. Maybe. I mean, Barry Letts is an amazing director and he's a great producer. And, and he's a, you know, I'm just not 100% sure he's that good a writer. So it was, it was a well, choice to go to. On, on that note, it made me think about, because he's he's got some great ideas in there and he's got some great things he wants to say, but he just wants to say them all at once, which I think is what what mars this story a lot. Um, because when he was writing for the TV series, he usually had a co-writer, didn't he? I think it was the, the Demons that was the only one he wrote by himself, wasn't it? Or was that with someone as well? I he usually wrote with Robert Sloman, Robert didn't Sloman. he? Sloman, yep. So... When he, when he wrote with Robert Sloman, not only did he have a co-writer to go, okay, well, let's get rid of that idea, that idea, and just stick with this idea, he also had Terence Dix. And I think Terence Dix was able to balance him out. So I think what we've got here is Barry Letts without the balancing influence of Terence Dix, which is what, uh, what poses the problems with the story, I think. What do you yeah, think you of could, that you, theory? You be, I think you could be right there. So, yeah, I think, yeah, better, better script writer, better, would have been good. Yeah. Or well, just a script editor would have been good. It's like it, It's like there's been no script editor there. Um, yeah. Although, although was there. Is there a script editor? I'm having a quick look. Can you see one or not? I can't see one. No, I can't see one in the in the liner notes. No. Yeah, so I don't, I don't even know if there was a script editor at all. You would think there would have been, but certainly not listed there. The one bugbear I have with the script, apart from everything else, is I have a real problem, because the new series has done it too, I have a real problem with the cliffhanger to episode one, where the Doctor falls off a building and then explains it away by saying he's made his bones go softer or something like that, so he's able to fall off the building. Well, my thought, my instant thought to that was Barry Letts was there during Logopolis, so why didn't the fourth Doctor soften his bones so that he didn't, you know, he was falling <laughs> from about the same height. Uh, the third well, doctor probably, survived, less, but the fourth doctor height. didn't. Yeah, probably, because it was a high rise, wasn't it, where he fell from. Yeah. So, yeah, that, 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 really, that really bugged me. But I don't know. 
maybe I'm only speaking as a as a fan who takes note of those little details. Um, but yeah, that was probably my biggest bugbear, particularly the first half of the story. Uh, some good scenes at the end uh, with the with the flying bats. I thought that was I thought that was good imagery um, that they could never have done on screen. So it was nice to be able to to have that, and it gave the the brigadier that sort of leadership role and he could be the hero there which i thought was really nice um so i i always enjoyed this story as as i said i've had that cassette since it came out so that was 1993 not probably 94 uh, when i bought that here in australia and i've listened to it quite a few times have you listened to it many times or just once or twice just once or twice so most recently yeah. Yeah, a couple of days ago but it would have been many many years and I'm pretty sure I've got a cassette too. I meant to go look to see, um, but yeah, it's yeah, it's, it's not it's not one that you would have pulled out often to listen to again. Hmm. Yeah. So I listen to it a lot, and yeah, I still I still have very fond, oh, not memories because I've got it in front of me, but fond feelings for it. Um, it it's really nice. And after listening to the Ghost of End Space, uh, this is definitely the better one of the two. That is for sure. And it's such a joy to hear the three leads together again. And and with Peter Miles as well. It's nice to nice to have him there too. Yeah, and, yeah. and John Peter would pass away within about twelve months of doing this, I think. Yeah. No, it was another three years. I've actually oh, got some audio oh, okay. I've actually got some audio of uh, John Pertwee talking about the Paradise of Death and and then talking about the Ghost of End Space as well and the delay uh, from the for, for the airing of the Ghost of End Space. So, do you, do you want to actually hear it before? Yeah, I... I'd love to actually. It'd be great. I've been uh, in uh, say a lot of theatre, a lot of plays. I did the Ultimate Adventure of Doctor Who. Some of you saw that probably. And uh, and we've done the Doctor Who on radio. Uh, we very successful the first series was, so we decided to make another. It took us ten and a half months to get the BBC to agree and when and it was going to be recorded, and eventually we did record it. We recorded it about six months ago. I had a letter from Phil Clark the other day, which giving me the news because the BBC, you know, really moves fast. I mean, they really know how to plug a program. They really, you know, get things on. And they'd informed us that they they are delighted that they are giving us a spot for the new one uh, called the Ghosts of End Space in 1996. Could you believe it? That's what they've told us. 1996 is the first opportunity they've got, the first slot. We think it's got something to do with this ridiculous Spielberg situation about Doctor Who. You know, that uh, Spielberg was supposed to have bought it, and uh, they were doing a big deal with the Enterprises and be at the BBC. Uh, but I never believed it, and it, they, they kept prevaricating, and we, you never got down to the nitty-gritty over the thing at all. And then we heard that Spielberg didn't like anything to do, like radio going out. He wanted everything, like Americans always do when they buy anything. That's why Wurzel was never done in America, because... Uh, Walt Disney wanted it, but they wanted everything. They wanted all the merchandising, they wanted everything. We, we got nothing. So we said no. And so I, I don't really think it's going to happen because Fox Television uh, said that they, there, were, there were enough science fiction programs on in, uh, on television in America at the moment and therefore they weren't that keen. Uh, but there are people who know a bit more about it. Jeremy Bentham was here. You, you'd speak to him about it. He knows more about it than anybody. But I don't think it's going to happen at all. And until such time as they make up their mind, we won't know whether a uh, program is going to be shown. And we should have made about six by now, because they're enormously popular. Did you hear what happened the last uh, when they showed The Paradise of Death? Wonderful. They, they played it, and they, they played it, uh, you know, one, there were five episodes, and they went one, two, three, four. Everybody said, great, the denouement next week. Ah, and they were all standing like this. And they listened for a couple of minutes, and they said, this is episode four again. They played the wrong one. You heard that? They played the wrong one. Thousands of people phoned up and said, What the bloody hell are you doing? I've waited a week to listen to this and you're playing this. They said, Oh my God, we are too. We're so sorry. We can't do it next week because we've got something very important, you know, like the um, Duchess of York marrying again or something or other, you know, something very important. And, and he said, So we, we'll do it the week after. And they said, Good, well, that's about time. And then they got together and they thought, If that number of people can phone up and jam those switchboards to complain, how many must be watching or listening to it as a program? And they'd made some inquiries and they found that masses of people were listening and had enormous figures. And so that's why they decided to do another one. So that's why they're in such a hurry to put it on to 1996. 
Um, I, I did recently um, at Indiana Jones, uh, young Indiana Jones, playing a, a, a marvelous part of a German general in charge of Ze Zeppelins in the First World War. Hey, I decided to talk right there because I'm so sick of old German officers shouting like Hitler, and it made a shame change to do, be somebody who was very badly wounded, and he had scars down here, and vocal cords were shot to pieces, you see, so, so it's more, I thought it was more menacing. It probably isn't, it's probably ridiculous, but uh, we'll soon see, we'll soon see. Uh, what else of that? Oh yes, I've, uh, if you see a thing called the All Electric Puppet Theatre around your area, which is a wonderful puppet show, which is for, uh, not just for kids, let me rush to say, it's magical production they do. I do all the voices uh, for it. And, uh, and I'm doing a, m uh, my one-man show all around the country this year. Uh, many more dates than I did last year. And then I'm doing a big one-man show with, with puppets and choir and orchestra doing things like Peter the Wolf, Carnival of the Animals, Tubby the Tuba, all those sort of big musical comedy pieces, and I'll be doing those. Uh, last week I did two Doctor Who books, uh, uh, Paradise of Death and uh, The Curse of Peladon, uh, for uh, audio department, which is now becoming very big, all this audio stuff on tapes and cassettes. Uh, and I did, uh, uh, that, that took a long time, uh, because there were 90 pages, and the day after I had to do a show called The Little Princess, which was very difficult because it had lines like, I want my potty said the little princess. <laughs> that was the first page. There were only about eight pages. It was an oh, lovely job, that was. And so I did that. And then I heard yesterday, on my way up to you, the phone rang and a friend of mine rang me up and said, I just got the world rights for Judge Dredd. Do you know Judge Dredd? He said, I just got the world rights for Judge Dredd and I want you to read it. So I shall be doing next week or week after, be doing Judge Dredd on audio. And that brings us right smack up to date at the moment, which brings me to you uh, uh, to sit here for however long I've got, uh, which is about half an hour, uh, to answer any questions that you might have, that you want me to answer, if I can. The great... Is that, those are my sandwiches. <laughs> you, you dropped some toilet paper here. <laughs> um, don't feel you have to ask questions about Doctor Who, but you probably will. So, uh, far away and speak up. Yes, madam. So, John Pertwee, always a lively character. And, uh, yeah, his complaint for the next radio production was that there was a three-year gap between this one and the next one. So, um, yeah, he was a bit he was a bit cynical there about that, but uh, always, very, always good a, to listen to. It's a very long gap. Yeah. Especially yeah, his age. Yeah, it was. Yeah. And, of course, 96, yeah, the... I, I'm not even sure when the Ghost of End Space was broadcast, but that was that was the time that he died. So, could have been around the the same the exact same time. Mm. So, um, I was happy to go back and have a listen to this, and I hope you were too, Philip. I'm certainly glad I went back and listened. To it. I'm not sure I'll bother again, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm glad I listened to it one more time. It's a it's a great piece, an interesting piece. Uh, interesting year, anniversary year. One of the other standout memories for that year, I think the afternoon show was still going and they started screening Doctor Who from an unearthly child, didn't they? Right. So it was great to see black and white Doctor Who on the TV screens back in 1993 mm. for, the, for the anniversary. And I think they did it again 10 years later. The ABC started screening. Yep. Uh, from the beginning 10 years later so they did they did a couple of things like that mm. so yeah interesting time the the early the the first half of the wilderness years and when i was still probably 93 i was still hoping that doctor who would come back mm. um i wasn't i wasn't quite giving up hope <laughs> yeah very good all right well now that we've talked about the paradise of death um have you got something that you would like to recommend or something that you've been listening to yeah, well, I will give something about been watching. So it's, okay. it's, once again, it's not particularly related to <laughs> Doctor Who because at the moment all my listening is concentrated on certain stories, and so my um, my list is not as broad as I would have liked. But a TV show I've just finished watching, um, which I think you'll find on it's HBO Max. I think it's on um, Paramount Plus, so on a streaming service. Um, it's called The Tourist. Um, so it stars uh, Jamie Dornan, 
who is famous for the Fifty Shades of Grey films, um, but it's nothing like that <laughs> at all. Uh, it's six episodes. It's set in the Australian outback, but as I said, it's a international film, but it's full of Australian actors. So wherever you are in, around the world, you'd be able to find this on, your, on a streaming service. And it starts with Jamie's character being hunted down by a truck. And you don't know what's going on, and he, you think he's got away, and he gets sideswiped and wakes up in hospital with no memory of who he is. And the entire show is him, actually, he has no memory at all, not getting his memory back, but knowing people are trying to kill him. And he's trying to unravel as much as he can what's going on in his life with other people, etc. Um, one of the main characters is called Lucy Miller, which, you know, for <laughs> big Finnish fans. Uh, there's amused, a connection. There's a connection there, which <laughs> amused me. But it's got an amazing cast, mainly of Australian actors. Jamie Dornan is, of course, um, Irish, and he's got his full accent happening, which he doesn't do in Fifty Shades of Grey. Um, he's, most of his Hollywood films, he has to put his American hat on, but it's Australian, so he puts his Irish on. But he's, a, he's he really is a, an astounding actor, and it's very suspenseful. It gets a bit bloody at times. There's, there's a bit of death. But it's really worth if it's if you love things being unveiled bit by bit and not working what the pieces are to the very end, uh, it's really worth seeing. And there's a few really great shock moments. So yeah, called the tourist. Have you heard of it? I've seen it. Oh, what do you think? Yeah, it was it was on Stan. Stan, thank you, mate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah really good. I, I must have watched it about six months ago, maybe with wow. uh, the wife. It was one of those bingey shows. Once you start, you've got to keep going. <laughs> yeah, well, I, so, I watched it. Two, I watched two or three episodes. After eleven o'clock at night for a couple, that's why I'm so exhausted. Um, <laughs> watch binging. Yeah, my wife goes to bed. And I binge on TV series, but yeah, this is just one I got caught up in, and yeah, I was really impressed by it. Very good. What about you? What have you been listening to or watching or what are recommend? I'm going to recommend for anyone who hasn't heard it. I've said it a couple of times in this episode, but don't listen to what I say. I recommend you go and listen to the Ghosts of N Space. Oh. If you haven't heard it, I think it's worth listening to once uh, because because of the – it's got Stephen Thorne in it and he's such a a classic Third Doctor era. Well, he was – how many was he in? He was in the two episodes, wasn't he, during during the Pertwee era? As uh, the demons and the three doctors. Yes. So he's got that – he's got that – and he was in the Hand of Fear too. So he's got the that voice that's uh, very recognisable – and uh, it's worth, it's definitely worth a listen. Uh, listen to it one episode at a time. Don't try and do it all at once because uh, you'll lobotomize yourself. But yeah, I th- even the even the bad Doctor Who is worth a go once. I say so. Yeah, the I Ghost agree. of N Space, Ghost of N Space. That's it. Okay. All right, that's it for this instalment of the Sirens of Audio. Next time we're going to be looking at the fortieth anniversary. And the lead up to the 40th anniversary Big Finish specials of Grace, that was led up uh, to with a trilogy of stories mm. called the Villains Trilogy. So the first story, Omega, second story, Davros, third story, Master. And we're going to uh, be joined by Ian Kubiak to chat about those stories and give you our thoughts and feedback on those. So hope you can tune back next time for that. Until then. It's been lovely being in your presence, Philip. It's been lovely being in your presence too, Dwayne. <laughs> and we'll catch you all next time. Bye, everyone. This has been the Sirens of Audio episode 171, looking back at the Doctor Who 30th anniversary and the paradise of death with your hosts, Philip Edney and Dwayne Bunny. Original theme music composed by Joe Kramer. More about us and tickets to Katie Manning in Australia from sirensofaudio.com. Comment below to let us know what you thought of the episode or contact us via email at sirensofaudio at gmail.com or any one of our socials. Thanks for listening, audio files. We'll hear you next time. <laughs>